All right, let's get to our prophecy update. If you're able to stay, we'd certainly encourage you to do so. If you have to leave, God bless you. Have a blessed week in the Lord. And Lord willing, we'll see you next Sunday. Remember now, not Thursday. So, I'm going to do something a little bit different today for today's update. It's actually, I was thinking about this this morning. We've never really done this before. I mean, we've talked about it, but not really in this way. And so I really sense that the Lord would have me today to do this checklist of sorts of Bible prophecies that have already been fulfilled. Uh, Let me say it this way. There are major prophecies in the Bible that you could, in the margin of your Bible, take a pen and write next to, which we're going to be talking about today, right next to them, write the word fulfilled and just put a check, done, fulfilled, exactly as God said it would happen. There are numerous prophecies that have been fulfilled. I mean, for those of you who I think we've talked about this on a Resurrection Sunday in the past, but all of the prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the coming Messiah that were fulfilled, and the statistical probabilities of those prophecies being fulfilled. In fact, one mathematician, his name is Peter Stoner, a brilliant man, calculated just the odds of one man fulfilling eight of the messianic prophecies concerning the coming Savior. Born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem. I mean, just took eight, and some have estimated there are over 300 of these prophecies. He just took eight. And to put it in to terms that we can kind of wrap our minds around, He said it this way, it would be like taking, I hope I get this right, silver dollars and stacking them over the entire state of Texas. And then you take a bird and you will, not a bird, that's a different, uh, I'm mixing my metaphors here, my analogies. You take a man, a bird can't pick up a, (laughs) a silver dollar. I I told my son Levi this. He goes, what's a silver dollar? I'm like, oh, you guys, this generation. Anyway, a silver dollar. It's a round silver coin worth a dollar. They don't make them anymore. If you have one, hold on to it. So you take a silver dollar, you stack it over the entire state of Texas. I forget how high it is. And you take a man, you give him one chance to pick one silver dollar stacked as high as they are, covering the entire state of Texas, and the odds of that man picking one, that one silver dollar, would be the same odds of one man fulfilling just eight of the over 300 prophecies of the coming Messiah that were fulfilled by Jesus Christ. How's that one? Does that make your hair hurt? I know it does mine, what's left of it anyway. I mean, it's mind boggling, right? Well, that's Old Testament prophecy concerning the Messiah. I want to talk about the prophecies concerning the return of Jesus Christ. There's a key prophecy, and it's a the source of much debate amongst amongst Bible scholars, but it's in three of the four Gospels. And it's basically when Jesus says that the generation alive that sees the rebirth of the nation of Israel will be the generation that will see the coming of the Son of Man. Well, as you might imagine, this has, you know, uh, led to much in the way of speculation. Many have tried to calculate, okay, well, how long is a generation? So if the rebirth of the nation of Israel, which took place on May 14th of 1948, which by the way, is the first prophecy that I want us to look at, because 
I believe this is the prophecy that set in motion. This is really when the clock began ticking, so to speak. Because the generation that would be alive at the time that Israel would be reborn as a nation, would be the same generation that would be alive at the return of Jesus Christ. So some have speculated, well, maybe it's 70 years. Well, from 1948 to 70, well, that's not going to work. Uh, <laughs> some thought uh, 40 years. That's why in 1988, you remember, some of you, uh, uh, remember that book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988? Uh, he wrote another book uh, yeah, after that. Um, that one's out of print <laughs> for obvious reasons. I think it was 89 reasons why he's coming in 89. I think he finally gave up, thank God. But unfortunately, there were so many more to take his place, Harold Camping being uh, more recent, where there's these date setters, which I think have given such a black eye to Bible prophecy, sadly. Well, let's start with this first prophecy. You can put a check mark next to Isaiah chapter 66, verse 8, because the prophecy is this, the rebirth of the nation of Israel in one day. And it happened in one day on May 14th, 1948, by one vote in the United Nations. And it was a fulfillment of Isaiah 66, 8. Listen to what it says. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. This was a prophecy written about the miraculous, and no nation in the history of mankind, after being dispersed for almost 2,000 years, ever returned as a nation, preserving their nationality, their language, their culture. Never happened before. That's why Isaiah sort of with a sanctified sarcasm says, who has heard of such a thing? <laughs> oh, God has and God did. Check. Number two, the Jews would return to their homeland. You can put a check next to Ezekiel chapter 37. I'm just going to read verses 11 and 12 and then verse 21. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry. This is affectionately referred to as the dry bones prophecy. How can these bones come to life again? Israel's dead. The Jewish people are dead. These bones are dry. Our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then, verse 21, say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, from the four corners, east, west, north, south, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Check. It continues today, the number of Jews that are returning to their ancient homeland. Number three, this is interesting. I don't know if you knew this or not. Whenever we go to Israel, we see this firsthand. The prophecy is that Israel would become one of the world's largest exporters of produce. 
Who knew? God knew. You have to understand. In the beginning of the last century, the early 1900s, the land was desolate. Malaria-infested swamplands. And here come the Jews, and they buy for an exorbitant amount of money the land from the Arabs, and they begin to plant and prosper and turn that malaria-infested land into a very productive land. I've got to share this story with you just real quick. So my aunt, who is now uh, with the Lord, this is when they first came to America is back in the 70s. And it was actually after the Six Day War in 1967. So it was the early 70s. And um, she's in church one day, and she, she's the one that told my family this story. And the church members at the time, I don't want to be derogatory, but um, they're like, you know, treating her like she's this uncivilized, you know, uh, you know, because she's from the Middle East, and what does she know about America? <laughs> so, you know, they, they're at the potluck, and um, they offer her this uh, uh, fruit, I think it was an orange, and said, uh, this is an orange, an orange, and it's very delicious. And she was very offended, and with good reason. Because, and she, this is my mom's sister, <laughs> you have to understand, it's, it's, it's a genetic thing. But uh, she, <laughs> she looked at this, this woman, this well-intentioned, you know, church member, and with her thick accent said, you have no idea what fruit is here in America. We have the most delicious fruit in the Middle East. Shame on you. Okay, wow. She's right. The fruit, how about in the hotel, those of you who have been to Israel with us? Oh, thank you, Donna. Oh, I'm getting hungry. Let's hurry up because um, <laughs> put a check mark next to Isaiah 27, 6. Listen to this. Those who come, he shall cause to take root in Jacob. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. I think uh, this is an older statistic. It's probably higher now. But uh, probably about, oh, maybe say 15, 20 years ago, they were the third, Israel was the third largest exporter of fruit. Have you seen a map lately of the size of Israel? I mean, it's the, this little itsy bitsy third largest exporter of fruit? <laughs> Check. Fulfilled. Isaiah 27, 6. Number four. It gets better. <laughs> Israel would plant vineyards. Now, I don't want to jam anybody's gears here, but uh, actually this last time, I think it was 2015 too, uh, when we were in Israel, uh, they, they were known and are known today for producing the best wine in the world. Again, I don't want to jam your gears here, and I don't want to get into that whole discussion. That's another topic for another time. We have tackled it before. I think we um, lost half the church after we did, but uh, touchy topic for sure. But this is a fulfillment of the prophecy in Joel chapter 3, verse 18. Listen to this. And it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord, and water the valley of Acacias. Number five. Israel would plant forests and trees. You can put a check mark next to Isaiah 41, verses 18 through 20. Listen to this. 
I will open rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. By the way, uh, maybe later on today when you get home, go online and search a satellite photo of the Middle East with Israel. You know what you're going to find? Uh, lush green Israel, dry barren everything else. Isaiah 41, turning the desolation into fountains and the wilderness into a pool of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree, the myrtle and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the cypress tree and the pine and the box tree together that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this, and the Holy One of Israel has created it, as only He can. Number six. This is a biggie too. Israel would recapture and inhabit Jerusalem, their eternal capital. You can put a check mark next to Zechariah 12, verse 6. And if you're there, stay there, because we're going to be right back there in just a moment. In that day, I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. The city, as we've talked about in past updates, the city that God has chosen to literally put His name of ownership on, Jerusalem. Number seven. You can put a little mark, but don't put a complete check mark by this one yet. This one is in real time, being fulfilled, and will, I believe, very soon ultimately be fulfilled. And it's that Jerusalem would become the intoxicating obsession of the entire world. The entire world will be obsessed with, intoxicated by, drinking from the cup of this one city, Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, verses 1 through 3, a prophecy. The word of the Lord concerning Israel, the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the human spirit within a person, declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem on that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her. I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. I believe this is speaking about the burdensome boundary stones of Jerusalem that the world will seek to divide, move the boundaries pre-1967, which I'm all for, by the way. Let's go way pre-1967, back into Genesis. I'm for that. That's pre-67. It just happens to be Genesis. <laughs> We can talk about those borders if you want. But they're going to seek to move the boundary stones. And God says, I'm, I'm going to make it immovable. And here's the thing, though. They're going to try to cut up Jerusalem. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cut them up. They're going to try to cut into pieces Jerusalem. I'm going to cut them into pieces. That's my city belongs to me. My name of ownership is on it. 
And do we not see this today, by the way? <laughs> we need look no further than to our news feeds to see that it's all about the problem of Jerusalem. Well, I ended with the Zechariah 12 prophecy for a reason. And the reason is, is that it brings us to the current and connects us to two more prophecies that I believe very soon will also have check marks next to them. I'm just not so sure we're going to be here to put the check marks on them. The first one is Isaiah 17 concerning the destruction of Damascus, Syria. And then with it, Ezekiel 38, which is a prophecy concerning the invasion of Israel by an alliance of nations with Russia, Iran, and Turkey at the helm. You know what is so fascinating about this particular prophecy? I mean, other than the fact that as we speak, Russia, Iran, and Turkey are at the ready in Syria to invade Israel for the purpose of the oil and the natural gas and the technology and the water and the gold and all of the prosperity, which is another prophecy that could be on our list. It's Saudi Arabia, who just this last week, once again, affirmed their support with, their aligning with Israel. You know, when we were in Israel this last time, uh, last year, uh, 2018, uh, we were privileged to have the former UN ambassador for Israel, Ron Prasor, who I had the privilege of meeting in 2015, when he, I think it was 2014, when uh, he was the keynote speaker. I was one of the speakers at University of Hawaii, a Night to Honor Israel event. And that's when I met him and um, got to know him. And he actually wrote me a letter of endorsement so I wouldn't get detained at the airport whenever I go to Israel, basically saying, this is a good guy. Uh, it was on the UN ambassador's uh, letterhead. And he's not an axe murderer. He's not a Lebanese terrorist. He's not a, you know, he is an Arab, but he's a good, good guy and he loves Israel. So <laughs> he's my friend. So anyway, I had reached out to him. Actually, I met, I, I ran into him in, of all places, uh, New York at the Fox News headquarters in 2017. And he said, hey, I, I told him, I said, I'm bringing a group. And he said, hey, if you want, I'll speak to the group. I said, you're on. So uh, I reached out to him and we set it up. And he came and he spoke to our group uh, one night when we were in um, Caesarea uh, by the sea, uh, Tiberias. And it was uh, really interesting. He made this comment. He said, you know, up to this point, Israel has had this uh, relationship with the Arab world, particularly the Gulf region, namely Saudi Arabia. But it's kind of been a, a, a hidden secret, you know, kind of like this mistress. And so, you know, there, were, there was always kind of this, you know, it was under the radar, uh, through the back door. Nobody knows. He said, not anymore. This is uh, November of, of last year. And oh my goodness, was he right. Because since that time, and really leading up to that time, Saudi Arabia and Israel are not bashful about their relationship together. This is Ezekiel 38 verse 13. You can almost put a mark right next to that particular verse, because it's almost fulfilled. Saudi Arabia will protest this invasion. Why? Because it's all about the oil. This thing in the Strait of Hormuz with Iran shooting down our drone, denying it. So, well, I think they, they, I think they had to acknowledge it because under the banner of it was in our airspace. Okay, whatever. Um, those two tankers there, you know what that's all about, right? It's all about the oil, the flow of oil oil, the world's dependence on the oil. But you know what's really interesting? America does not depend on that oil, which is, well, <laughs> I don't know, I'm going to get way off and <laughs> don't look at your watches. We're almost done, sort of, kind of, yeah, <laughs> ish, <laughs> heavy on the ish. <laughs> 
Here's my point, okay? My point is this. I truly believe that we are on the cusp of these prophecies being fulfilled by virtue of the aforementioned prophecies already being fulfilled. I hope that makes sense. From 1948, May 14th, to what's today? June 30th, 2019. Look how much has happened, and look at how fast what is happening now is happening. I know that's proper, not proper sentence structure, but you get the point. And by virtue of the fact that these, pro you might say it like this, and I hope it's not too uh, crass, but God has a pretty good track record, doesn't He? Like a thousand percent, if there was such a percentile. It has happened exactly as God said it would. Here's a, a thought, um, and then I want to share this Breaking News Israel uh, article that, that came out this last week. Think about this. So uh, wouldn't it stand a reason that there's a, I'll use the uh, word shelf life, uh, there's an expiration date because the prophecies that are now in play today weren't in play even five years ago, and I would argue may not still be in play five years from now. I'm not date setting. I'm just presenting a scenario that should be logical in the sense that as fast as everything has moved up to this point, does it stand to reason that it would slow down at this point? with an unstoppable momentum. There's an, an expiration date, if you will. Uh, just in the last couple of years, Russia, Iran, Turkey, and Syria, uh, a lot of things can happen in, in one year, two years. How about six months? In other words, there's a, a shelf life, an expiration date, I believe, on Bible prophecy. So on Wednesday, Breaking Israel News published this report in which they asked the question of, is Gog and Magog heating up? <laughs> you think? Russia is clarifying its position that they will side with Iran against the U.S. and Israel. <gasps> Are we surprised? Are we surprised? <laughs> you know why? Because Ezekiel 38 said they would. That's why. You know why Russia, Iran, and Turkey are in Syria? Because Ezekiel prophesied 2,600 plus years ago that they would. I'm going to get my asthma uh, going here if I keep doing that. So take a deep breath. Russia, Russia's chief national security advisor defended Iran's claims during a trilateral meeting with his Israeli and American counterparts in Jerusalem on Tuesday. This is the last Tuesday. And he clarified his support for Tehran's accusations against the U.S. and backs their current military presence in Syria, which Israel, again, no surprise, <laughs> considers to be a threat to its national security. As a, time doesn't permit, but uh, uh, reports coming out of Israel, Netanyahu is making it again very clear. He's clarifying his position as well uh, concerning Iran in Syria in no uncertain terms. This is exactly as we were told it would be. Okay. Appreciate your patience. I think we need to be asking ourselves this question. And it's a question actually that I get asked often. I've talked with other guys that I really respect as well concerning this. But the question is this, where does the rapture fit into all of this? We don't know. In other words, is the rapture going to happen after Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38? Don't know. 
Is the rapture going to happen before Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38? I don't know. Now, last week, I suggested a plausible scenario that the rapture could take place simultaneously with the sudden destruction that comes down on them while they are saying those two words, peace and security. Then, while they're saying that, sudden destruction comes down. I think it's very possible. Now, if that's the case, whatever the case is, wouldn't it stand to reason, I'm asking, wouldn't it stand to reason <laughs> that it could happen at any time? Let, let me ask this question. Do you think it's reasonable that you and I could wake up tomorrow morning, July 1st, and on our news feeds, we will read that Damascus is being destroyed suddenly. And Russia and Iran and Turkey are, I, I would rather read it <laughs> up there. But isn't that reasonable? With everything that's happening, especially with the development in the Persian Gulf with Iran right now, and Russia coming to their defense. I shared this last week, and I'll, I'll end with it again this week. But do you know why we do these prophecy updates? We do these prophecy updates because it is a warning as a watchman on the wall of what's coming. And as I shared from Ezekiel 33 last week, I don't want any of your blood on my hands. So I would rather warn you and have nothing happen than not warn you only to have something happen, because God's going to hold me to an account. So every week I'm going to come up here, as is my privilege to do, and stand behind this pulpit and talk about just how close we really are based on the prophecies in the Bible and the developments in the world which connect with those prophecies in the Bible, with precision accuracy. And then I'm going to continue as long as God <laughs> enables me and gives me breath to share the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's the gospel? Paul, writing to the Corinthians in chapter 15, says it's that Jesus Christ came, that He was crucified, that He was buried, and that He rose again on the third day. Writing to the Thessalonians, he says, and He's coming back one day. That's the good news. That's the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, the ABCs of salvation, which I'm going to continue as long as the Lord gives me breath and allows me the privilege to, I'm going to share the ABCs of salvation. Why? Because it is a childlike explanation of salvation. The A is for admit or acknowledge that you've sinned and that you need the Savior. This is repentance. Repentance means a change of mind. You, you've had a change of mind concerning your sin against God and your need for the Savior. That's repentance. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We were all born sinners, which is why we must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. This is the bad news. This is the pronouncing of the death penalty on all, because all have sinned. But the gift of God the good news is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the A. Here's the B. The B is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ 
is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Is this too simple? Is it too good to be true? Well, guess what? God is too good and God is true. So in God's economy, there's no such thing as too good to be true. If it's true, it's God. If it's good, it's God. Here's the C. C is for call upon the name of the Lord, or as Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says, confess with your mouth. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's why. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And lastly, Romans 10, 13, this is what seals the deal. It says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will, not might, could, should, no, will be saved. Once you all stand, I, I just want to end as the worship team comes up. I want to say first to anybody that might be here in this church service today, that has never called upon the name of the Lord. You've just seen a list of prophecies that were fulfilled with 100% accuracy, and the connecting prophecies that I assure you will also be fulfilled with 100% accuracy. It reminds me of what Jesus said in John 14, 29. He said, I have told you what's going to happen before it happens. So when it happens, <laughs> you will believe that I am the great I am. To the believer in Luke 21, 28, he says, when you see these things begin to come to pass, they're beginning to come to pass. Jesus said, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws nigh. His return is at the door. And for anyone who has never called upon the name of the Lord, I implore you to not put off the most important decision you will make in your life for eternal life. You might be watching this video online. It's not by accident <laughs> that you came upon this video, or it showed up in the column there, and you clicked on it. It's for you. The Lord wants a relationship with you, a saving relationship with you. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the good news. Thank you for the free gift paid for by you in full, costing you everything, your life, but made free to us to accept the free gift of eternal life. Lord, I pray for anyone who has never called upon you, confessing with their mouth, believing in their heart, acknowledging their sin, falling short of your perfect standard of righteousness. Lord, I pray that today, this day, would be the day of their salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.